Hello everyone, it is yet another day in this The Clown Decade, the decade where things are only going to get worse before they get better. And today we're doing a classic in that we are covering a trans issue and at the same time we are doing a little bit of an in-depth dive into the actual source material of what this entire argument's about. Because the TERFs and the TRAs are at it again, and if there is one thing I have learned from listening to TERFs and TRAs, it is not to trust a word that either side says. Having said that, in my experience of this debate, the TERFs tend to be closer to the truth than the TRAs, but as far as I'm aware, it's always been a let them fight type scenario, because an awful lot of TERFs seem to end up just hating men. A recent example being uh, a popular question going viral at the moment is asking women would they rather be stuck in a forest with a man or a bear. And an awful lot of them are saying a bear because, oh, the man might attack me, as if the bear isn't going to completely maul them. But anyway, no point dwelling on that. We may as well get right into it. So for those who don't know what the CAS review is, it is an independent review of gender identity services for children and young people. And this is now the final report, the interim report, which came out a few years ago, managed to get the Tavistock Centre completely closed down because it was effectively abusing kids. And from there, they have decided to open up four new trans child clinics around the UK that actually have proper review boards, proper insights into what they're actually doing. And generally, the whole thing is just safer for kids who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria or who think they may have gender dysphoria. And this report is the final document about what happened in that clinic, whether there was any medical backing in that clinic, whether it was ethical to even have that clinic, and what is actually the best thing to do for children who may think they have gender dysphoria. And this is all good stuff. This is what I would expect from the medical field, especially with something as new as treating kids for gender dysphoria, because that is literally only something that was even a concept about 50 years ago. And I mean, for centuries we were using leeches to try and heal people. It's a pretty silly post-enlightenment assumption that we would never do anything as evil or as self-destructive as that again. And yet here we are, we are in the middle of a debate of what is the best way to treat kids that aren't sure about their own body, as if that's not been a common thing throughout human history. So anyway, just to touch upon what each side of the debate is saying, J.K. Rowling is a pretty good lightning rod for the TERF viewpoint at the moment. And effectively, the TERFs are defending this report because, well, <laughs> from what news articles are saying about it, it is pretty much on the TERF side in that we have probably been abusing kids in the gender identity clinics for the past few years. And so JK Rowling had a bit of a thread on defending the report, but just the first tweet will do. Over the last four years, Hilary Cass has conducted the most robust review of the medical evidence for transitioning children that's ever been conducted. Mere hours after it was released to the press and public, committed ideologues are doubling down. And obviously the tweet that JK Rowling is quoting is from an account that has now protected its tweets probably because it said something absolutely ridiculous and probably because people reacted to that ridiculous take by pointing out it was ridiculous. And generally from the trans radical activist side, they are coming out and saying that effectively this report isn't at all a reliable report and in fact is just full of bias. Uh, in fact, there have even been memes going about of what is in the cast report and why it is ridiculous. And this is going to be the basis of what we are going to be looking at in the report. I'm going to be taking each one of these points and seeing what the report actually has to say about each point and whether this means that the report is complete nonsense or whether the report is actually quite robust and a useful report and one that we should probably be following the advice of. So, we may as well get into it. So first thing to get out of the way, this report is 388 pages long. I'm just going to say it now. I'm not reading the whole damn thing. Trans radical activists aren't reading the whole damn thing. No turf has read the whole damn thing. I don't think anyone is ever going to read the whole damn thing. What we are going to do, though, is read the summary and recommendations, because <laughs> that's pretty much what everyone else is going to be reading. So we may as well get our take here before we get back into the meme. So point one, the aim of this review is to make recommendations that ensure that children and young people who are questioning their gender identity or experience in gender dysphoria receive a high standard of care. Care that meets their needs is safe, holistic and effective. 
at its heart of vulnerable children and young people and an NHS service unable to cope with the demand. All of that is simply true. I do completely trust that this report is actually trying to find the best way to care for trans kids. And it's been a well-established fact for years at this point that the NHS has not been able to cope with the demand, the exponentially rising demand, by the way, of kids demanding trans healthcare treatment. From the start, the review stepped into an arena where there were strong and widely divergent opinions unsupported by adequate evidence. I, at least that's not just pointing out one side, because I think I would honestly say both sides seem to be uh, making wild accusations of each other and of what the actual, <laughs> I guess I hate using this term, but what the science says. The surrounding noise and increasing toxic, ideological and polarised public debate has made the work of the review significantly harder and does not and does nothing sorry, to serve the children and young people who may already be subject to significant minority stress. Because yes, you will find out in this report that there is plenty of evidence to say that there were people that were happy to try and make this report as hard to write as possible. And I completely agree with the report when it says this does absolutely nothing to help the children. Because in, from my point of view, what is happening to kids at the moment is effectively another... I mean, this is a mental health crisis like we've never seen it before, but in the past, you know, in, in the 90s, there were, you'd say, bulimic epidemic. You know, people were throwing up to try and make themselves skinnier, become anorexic because they felt fat. And it, this was a rare thing, and it's still a rare thing now. However, then you go 10 years later, self-harm was a big epidemic. And now, I, pretty much everyone who is trans pretty much loves listing off what mental health issues they have, whether it's depression, anxiety, etc, etc. And so to me, this looks like effectively a mass coping mechanism for childhood depression and things like that. And as this report says, that is something that we need to look at, and that's very difficult to look at properly, when there are people out there that are doing their best to make this work close to impossible. Within the context of the review set out to understand the reasons for the growth in referrals and the changing epidemiology, and to identify the clinical approach and service model that would best serve this population. There are conflicting views about the clinical approach, with expectation at times being far from usual clinical practice. This has made some clinicians fearful of working with gender-questioning young people, despite their presentation being similar to many children and young people presenting to other NHS services. And point five even directly references the ongoing culture war between TRAs and TERFs. Uh, and the start of it, which I find the funniest, is literally just calling out social justice warriors. Although some think the clinical approach should be based on a social justice model, the NHS works in an evidence-based way. I mean, this report is basically just a massive attack on TRAs. I can understand why they are so annoyed <laughs> at this report. And honestly, I think it is a very good thing that this final report is directly calling out the TRAs in this way, because it's true. They are not basing what they want on evidence. They are basing it on effectively, oh, I know a bunch of people that feel really, really good about being given hormones as quickly as possible and being put on puberty blockers as early as possible, and they just feel great about it without realising that, well, yeah, in the short term, you probably do. I, I have no doubt about that. However, people on cocaine feel the same way whenever they take a sniff. In other words, short-term happiness is not enough evidence to say that this is the best thing to do for you. There are plenty of other options out there that would probably make you feel a similar way and isn't going to screw up your bones at the same time. When the review started, the evidence base, particularly in relation to the use of puberty blockers and masculinizing or feminizing hormones, had already been shown to be weak. Oh dear. There was and remains a lot of misinformation easily accessible online with opposing sides of the debate pointing to research to justify a position regardless of the quality of the studies. This is absolutely true. I've seen it firsthand myself. Hell, Keffels was trying to give out black market hormones to people that thought they were trans. Trying to use nonsense studies as a way to say, see, the science says it's okay, but the Republicans don't want you to know about it. To understand the best way to support children and young people, the review's ambition was therefore not only to understand the existing evidence, but also to improve the evidence base so that young people, their families and carers, and the clinicians working with them 
have the best information upon which to form their decisions. To scrutinise the existing evidence, the review commissioned a robust and independent evidence review and a research programme from the University of York to inform its recommendations and remain cautious in its advice while awaiting the findings. In other words, this is going to be a huge meta-analysis of studies that, that have already come out while at the same time actually going through its own studies with its methodology which it knows it can trust to get the best quality evidence possible to actually understand the best way to actually help trans kids. This report is good work as far as I can tell so far. And as I said before, the fact that they are calling out social justice warriors directly in the summary, that's huge. I wasn't expect I genuinely wasn't expecting that. But that really shows that they understand the issues with the public debate going on at the moment when it comes to this issue. Effectively, what this report has done is, you know, I'm not saying it saw my videos, but it certainly took problems that me and a lot of other people had with the trans clinics at the time and genuinely took them on board and said, no, this is actually a problem. We're going to try and fix it. And, and that's great. It's good to know that four years ago, I noticed a problem and it turns out that <laughs> there's actually experts out there that realize it is a problem. This is good. This is a bit white pilling, to be honest. The University of York's programme of work has shown that there continues to be a lack of high quality evidence in this area and disappointingly, as will become clear in the report, attempts to improve the evidence base has been thwarted by a lack of cooperation from the adult gender services. In other words, this report that is supposed to be investigating the best way to actually treat trans people and trans kids has a lack of cooperation from the places that are effectively going to be <laughs> scrutinized by this report let's say in other words it's it, you know smoke no smoke without fire type thing there is a reason that they are not cooperating with this report despite the fact that this report's actual mission stated mission is to find the best way to help people with gender dysphoria as possible this makes it look like that's not what they actually want. And that's quite concerning. The review has therefore had to base its recommendations on the currently available evidence supplemented by its own extensive programme of engagement. In other words, they wanted to conduct studies on existing gender identity clinics, both for kids and adults. And instead of cooperating, effectively these clinics said, no, you're not doing that. I'm just leaving a pause there because I don't know what I'm supposed to say about that. That's obviously awful. And I don't understand why anyone would try and defend that. Because even if these clinics think that this report is going to take the worst point of view possible when it comes to it, surely you'd want the evidence for yourself anyway and come up with your own reports to try and debunk whatever this report says that you disagree with. But no, they didn't even do that. They didn't even allow them onto step one. Which, as I say, is very concerning and, for lack of a better term, very suspicious. Hearing directly from people with lived experience and clinicians has provided valuable insights into the ways in which the services are currently delivered and experienced. This has contributed to the review's understanding of the positive experiences of living as a trans or gender diverse person. Gender diverse person. I... It's, it's like neurodivergent person. It, it's just, it's more words to throw into the lexicon to effectively try and make people seem as not normal as possible because that is genuinely what gives people value at this point or they feel like it. Are you a straight white male? You have absolutely no value whatsoever. As I say, the bear question. I'd rather be stuck with a bear than a straight white male in a forest. Despite the fact your chances of survival actually massively increase with a straight white male in the forest as your companion. But then you say you're a neuro spicy person who is also gender spicy. I, I mean, they're effectively treated as deities. It's, it's really strange. We didn't make great works of art and we didn't make great civilizations by pretending that men and women don't exist. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent and language like that... <laughs> That almost looks like it's supposed to be a kind of olive branch to the trans radical activists by allowing their made up concepts to be put into this report. But hey, I'm trying to go, I'm going to try and make this as neutral as possible. So let's just go ahead, assuming it is an accepted term in the medical practice. 
as well as the uncertainties, complexities and challenges faced by children, young people, their families and carers, and those working in and around the services trying to support them. So, as I say, this report has tried to get as much evidence as it can, even anecdotal evidence, which I, I think is fine. Point 12 just lays out the plan of the report, we don't really need to go through that, so we'll just skip to 13, which says, at the end of this review, while there is still uncertainty, the following remains true. And I would like to point out that that first line is incredibly important. They accept that there is still uncertainty. That alone shows that this report is worth reading. There are children and young people, families and carers, all trying to make sense of their individual situations, often dealing with considerable challenges and upheaval. I have no doubt about that. These kids have huge mental health problems. The length of the waiting list to access gender services has significant implications for this population and the NHS service delivery the implications being bad ones. Generalizations about children and young people questioning their gender identity or experiencing gender dysphoria are unhelpful. People are individuals, sure. Young people's sense of identity is not always fixed and may evolve over time. But isn't that obvious? There should be no hierarchy of gender identity or how this is expressed, be that socially or medically. Nobody should feel the need to invalidate their own experience for fear it reflects badly on other identities and choices. Okay, I'd love to see more detail about what they mean by that. When they say there should be no hierarchy of gender identity, does that mean completely get rid of the gender spectrum and just make it clear that there are only men and women, with the exception, obviously, of intersex people who try and fit into those boxes anyway? Or does it mean keep the gender spectrum, just don't try and make it out that trans people are better than cis people? Which I, I, I guess that's better than what the TRAs are trying to do, I suppose, but it still seems off to me, but... Hey, I am reading this with an open mind. While some young people may feel an urgency to transition, young adults looking back at their younger selves would often advise slowing down. Which is interesting because internet's trans radical activists would give you the complete opposite impression. An awful lot of them seem to say, no, I wish I started transitioning at six or something like that. But it appears that when this report is actually asking people anonymously, an awful lot of them are saying, mm, actually probably shouldn't have jumped into that like I did. For some, the best outcome will be transition. Okay. Whereas others may resolve their distress in other ways. Some may transition and then de or retransition and or experience regret. The NHS needs to care for all those seeking support. Sure. Um, I mean, maybe transitioning is the best outcome for some. Maybe it's only the best that we have found so far. I'm not too sure, but as I say, reading this with an open mind. The care of this population needs to be holistic and personal. Mm, yeah, it's a psychological issue, that's absolutely true. It may compromise a wide range of interventions and services, some of which can be delivered outside NHS specialist services, effectively meaning some depressed people just need exercise and a better diet. There remains diversity of opinion as to how to best treat these children and young people. The evidence is weak and clinicians have told us they were unable to determine with any certainty which children and young people will go on to have enduring trans identity. Yeah, that's pretty much been common knowledge for most sensible people for years. Many primary and secondary care clinicians have concerns about their capacity and competence to work with this population, and some are fearful of doing so given the surrounding social debate. <laughs> In other words, the whole debate on how to best deal with trans kids is absolutely ruining their healthcare. Because on one hand, you've got people trying to rush them through hormone therapy and all that stuff and on the other side they're saying oh no turfs aren't even saying do nothing that they're saying treat them like any other kid who's got mental health issues you know don't just put them on hormones because they demand it our current understanding of long-term health impacts of hormone interventions is limited and needs to be better understood again that's true from what i've read Young people become particularly vulnerable at the point of transfer to adult services. Well, that is definitely going to require more detail, because I'm not sure exactly what that means. Anyway, finishing off this summary, whatever your views on gender identity, there is no denying that there are an increasing number of children and young people seeking support from the NHS for gender-related distress. They should receive the same quality of care as other children and young people experiencing distress. Again, yeah, sure, I'm just not convinced that most of these children going to the gender identity services actually should be going there and should just be going into general mental health services. A compassionate and kind society ugh, remembers that there are real children, young people, families, carers and clinicians behind the headlines. 
The review believes that each individual child and young person seeking help from the NHS should receive the support they need to thrive. And this is, again, this is true, and this is generally why when I am complaining about the whole trans debate, I am specifically trying to attack arguments, trying to attack trans radical activists whose arguments are very weak, and who frankly are very dishonest, as we are probably going to find out in this video. If they tr think transitioning was the best thing to do for themselves, that is their choice, that is their opinion, that is their road to walk down. And I have nothing but compassion for that, because I don't think it's the best thing for them to do. I seriously don't. But they think it is, that is their choice, and I hope they do have a good and find content in their lives, because I think Everyone deserves to at least try and find that. I just think they've been looking in the wrong place for it with hormones, plastic surgery, and frankly, trying to live a lie. But uh, as I say, compassion for these people, please. They are people with genuine health problems, and there's no need to be rude or harsh about them. And I'm happy that the report is making that clear. This So far, this summary has been, as far as I'm concerned, very good. So now it's time to get in the details and see what the trans radical activists' problem are with this report. And if you just wanted a summary of everything I had to say about this, I, I guess that's pretty much it. You, you can end this video at 21 minutes, but I would stick around. I think it's going to get quite funny. So back to the trans radical activist meme. The wildest things that came out of the CAS report on trans healthcare. So, point number one, it considers 98% of studies on trans healthcare produced in the past decades to be invalid because they weren't double-blinded, which means the report's author wanted to test a group of trans kids to be forced not to transition alongside the ones who did for these studies. So, already, just off the top of my head, when it comes to studying medical procedures and especially medical practices, you obviously have control groups. What this is saying is wild is that it rejected studies that did not have control groups. That isn't wild, that is basic ethical practice in the study of science. It's one of the most basic tenets. It was made clear even at GCSE level science. You have control groups, otherwise your data is useless. This is one of the big reasons that Nutrition is a completely useless field to actually study scientifically or purely scientifically because it's impossible to have control groups. But anyway, let's see what the CAS report has to say about this. So after a scan through most of the report trying to find the words double-blinded, which by the way doesn't even turn up in the report, and trying to find wherever 98% turns up in the report, turns out nowhere in the report does it say it rejected, 98% of them. However, as we go through, I'm sure we will find clarifying statements on that. I think it's worth going through the understanding evidence section, as this is what the critique is about. The review's interim report set out the importance of evidence-based service development and highlighted major gaps and weaknesses in the evidence base underpinning the clinical management of children and young people with gender incongruence and gender dysphoria, including the appropriate approaches to assessment and treatment. In particular, it became apparent how little was known about the medium and longer term outcomes for children and young people receiving NHS support and or treatment. Mm. The quality of the evidence base for interventions for gender incongruence and dysphoria is a source of debate and contention. This makes it very difficult for young people and their families to know what information to trust and what to expect from the treatment offered. A fundamental principle of clinical medicine is that treatment should be offered based on the best available evidence. In evidence-based practice, three factors determine treatment decisions, research evidence, clinical expertise, and patient values. In other words, what this whole section so far has said is that we need very good evidence so that we can actually treat patients, and there's basically no reliable evidence on this. Or at the very least, the evidence we do have on it that is of good quality is very limited in scope, because of course it is. Not only do you have not very many trans people, you have not very many people actually studying the issue properly. For example, if a doctor diagnoses a patient with depression and recommends a particular antidepressant medication, they should invariably explain that there is a strong evidence that the drug is effective. For example, it has an 85% chance of improving the depression. The doctor will also point out possible side effects. For example, it has a 5% chance of causing weight gain. If the patient already happens to be very distressed about being overweight, 
they may not feel that the potential belief of the drug outweighs the risk that they may gain weight. The doctor will then consider other options. For example, there may be a different drug that does not cause weight gain but increases risk of suicide. If the patient has made a recent suicide attempt, that would not be an appropriate alternative to offer to this patient. Without this evidence for benefits and harms, it is hard for doctors to advise the patient and for the patient to decide whether they want to try the proposed treatment. In other words, they are really trying to lay on thick the fact that when you have evidence-based approaches to actually giving out medication, the patient at the end of the day has to decide what is best for them. They have to weigh up pros and cons. And a problem that the subtext so far of this report has been doctors aren't really giving people the idea that there are any actual harms to transitioning. Hence, a lot of people are falling into it. I mean, a great example is of... Uh, that streamer, what's it called? I think it's called Finister, who recently came out with a video that they're going full trans, or he's going full trans and is now on HRT. And this is what he had to say when he made up a list of should he transition or not. I have this notes page on my phone from over a year ago now with a handwritten note of like pros and cons list of taking HRT. And when I went to go fill out the cons list, there wasn't much I could come up with. I mean, that that is just nuts. That is crazy. You couldn't come up with any cons. This is why people call it a, a cult, by the way, because, well, long story short, the people who are advocating it are literally saying there are no cons. I mean, there is absolutely no medical professional in the world that would ever say that there are no cons unless they're a total charlatan. And, and this is a big problem people have. This is why this report probably had a big issue actually being made because there are plenty of people that don't want the cons actually looked into, because they are probably actually really horrible. I mean, obviously that's a worst case scenario for why they'd be doing it, but I do not believe that most of them aren't being cooperative based purely on the fact that they don't trust Hillary Cass. I, I reckon they are trying to hide something. Anyway, we are here to talk about why some studies were rejected, and so you can read the whole of these sections yourself. I'm not going to be that in depth when it comes to this video we have a lot to get through so i'm just going to go to the pitfalls of treatment trials a major problem in making sense of trial findings is bias there are many ways in which results can be biased for example if 50 percent of the sample drops out this would be referred to as a high attrition rate it's possible that people who remained in the study are those who responded well to the treatment whereas those who drop out did so because the treatment wasn't working for them or if they had bad side effects this could result in a positive bias in the study outcomes, in other words, showing an effect when there isn't one. It could also fail to show the side effects that cause people to drop off. Yes, this point is made quite eloquently in quite a spicy way with this particular meme, in which the headline of the article is Majority of trans adults are happier after transitioning, survey finds, and then obviously underneath you've got the survivor bias plane. Effectively, for those who don't know what this means, is where you are seeing these red marks is where planes that survived have bullet holes. And so engineers thought, oh, we just put more armor there because that's where the bullets are going. And then the commanding officer points out, no, you've got that completely backwards. These planes are surviving. They're coming back with bullet holes here because that's not where the issue is. The issue is where the dots aren't. So what this meme is effectively trying to say is that it's making the same point here. You've got survivor bias here. People are dropping out. I mean, the CAS report puts it in a really nice way, but there is also a chance that effectively some of these trans people killed themselves before they finished the study. And a big problem with the study is that if you just ignore these people that dropped out of the study, then you're not doing the due diligence of saying, well, the findings of this report aren't very good because we can't exactly say what happened to the people who dropped out of the report. And if half the people are dropping out, that kind of indicates that, well, this treatment isn't working for an awful lot of them. And this is why you need control groups as well. Anyway, carrying on, another way of biasing results is if patients in the treatment and control groups differ in some way. For example, one group has more people who are younger or sicker. Researchers will assess the groups on several measures and compare them to see if they are similar at the start of the study baseline assessment. Random allocation of people to the study groups and large numbers of participants help reduce the risk of differences between study groups. In other words, when you do have a control group, you better make sure they're as similar to the study group as much as possible. If you've got a control group that are like, you know, 10 years old, but all your trans young people are 15 that you're studying on, obviously your results aren't going to be very good. 
at finding the differences. It is very important to get the inclusion and exclusion criteria of a study right, that is, which patients can and cannot be included. For example, a trial might report that a painkiller is highly effective, but if it turns out that only people with osteoarthritis in the knee were included, it would mean that the results cannot be generalised to patients with headaches. Although the drug may work very well for a headache, it is not possible to be sure about this on the basis of finding this particular study. In other words, we are getting rid of studies in which we can't generalise the treatment to all trans people because it were, could only be for specific types of trans people. I don't know, this study was only done on people with gender dysphoria when they were 12, but we don't know about it when they're 22 or something like that. Again, quite robust reasons for excluding studies here, and uh, we're not even done yet. In any design where patients are not blinded and know they are getting a particular drug or where they have chosen a specific treatment rather than being randomised to one, that may show improvements because of a placebo effect, that is, they believe that the treatment will produce a beneficial outcome. And again, I think this is where the double-blinded thing comes from, but as you can see, they only say blinded. That might just be a distinction without a difference, but either way, I don't really care. You need control groups and testing placebo effects is completely standard practice in the medical field. There, there are TRAs out there saying, oh, you're denying trans people healthcare, when in reality, we're just seeing if the placebo effect will work. And if it does, why give them risky puberty blockers? Sometimes there are compounding factors in a study, such as the patient getting another treatment at the same time as the trial treatment, the randomization and blinding minimize the risk of bias and confounding. This is not completely watertight. Again, this is what I'm liking about this report. It is saying, look, there are ways around these biases. They're not perfect, but we have to take into account all of these different factors. And that shows that they were serious about finding the best treatment for trans kids, which is what I've been wanting for years. There must be enough patients in a trial. The term sufficiently powered is, uh, powered is often used when there are. To be sure, the results reflect a range of possible outcomes and do not give a positive result by chance, a so-called type 1 or alpha error. Study outcome measures are generally reported as the average for a group, but the range is usually also given and can be very wide. For example, if the average outcome for a group is 5 points out of possible 10, a range of 2 to 9 would indicate much more varied outcomes across the group rather than a range of 4 to 6. Size influences whether the reported, I mean that's just precision versus accuracy by the way, effectively it's saying these reports can be very accurate but how precise they are matter too. And if you have very wide ranging results, effectively what you can say is, well, you might be on something there, but you need to look into specific parts of this trial and see why there's such a range and try and get that range down a bit. Size influences whether the reported outcomes are statistically significant in very small studies, for example, one with only four patients put on a treatment and in which three got better and one got worse, it would not be possible to understand the full range of possible outcomes. Furthermore, the benefits for three individuals could have happened by chance. For results to be statistically significant, it must be unlikely that the result could have happened by chance. This is why substantial numbers of participants are required, and a key requirement for any trial is a pre-recruitment estimate of how many will be needed for the study to produce meaningful results. In other words, have a big sample size. There are many other potential problems, some of which include unconscious bias in questionnaire design, where the questions are written in a way that prompts more favourable responses. I mean, that's a problem with every questionnaire. Using the wrong kind of analysis for the available data. Duh. Not following up long enough to see the full benefits or harms of a treatment. Yep, true. Seeing an improvement because patients were improving spontaneously over time. Or publication bias where, for example, only positive results are published. And we are seeing that more and more in the world of science. So these are absolutely all problems that I am seeing throughout an awful lot of scientific studies in recent years, the fact that this report is taking that on board and taking it into account is very good news. In other words, if these are the reasons that 98% of studies were rejected, then I have no issue with that. I, as they said at the start, the studies going into how best to treat trans kids is very limited. It's not then therefore surprising that a vast majority of them were rejected because they are limited in scope or due to these other pitfalls. So just to try and finish off this section as quickly as possible and explain why majority of the studies were rejected, 
what this report's goals were was to effectively make a systematic review and meta-analysis of all data that they could find on trans kids, trans people and medical procedures to see overall what is best to do for these kids. And they have a perfect example of this pyramid here. Effectively, information quality goes up as you go up the pyramid and the information volume decreases as you go up the pyramid as effectively you're trying to massively filter the information that is coming through. So as you can see at the very bottom, effectively, you have expert opinion, background information, anecdotal evidence. And then as you go up, you have better quality of data as it gets to more randomized sampling, more specialized trials, more specific studies into what different drugs do to people, things like that. And then effectively at the top, this golden part of the pyramid, the filter of information, that is what this report is trying to do. So as you can see from the pyramid, I mean, this is just a representation, there was always going to be a large rejection of studies here because they only want the highest quality information. And so a single search strategy was developed for all systematic reviews to identify studies examining gender dysphoria, gender related distress or gender incongruence in children or adolescents. The search was conducted between 13 and 23 May 2021 and then updated on 27 April 2022. In other words, they spent about two weeks trying to find all the studies that they could on gender related issues in children. The reference list of eligible studies and any relevant system systematic reviews, including clinical guidelines that were identified were also checked. In other words, they made a list and checked it twice. So overall, searches yielded 28,147 records. Figure seven shows the number of studies that met the criteria for inclusion. In addition, the research team monitored for and appraised relevant references that were published after the primary search. So they included studies after this search as well, if they found it to be useful. And as you can see from figure seven above, you can find a quick dissection of where each of the fields of these studies came from. But uh, just on this point, I want to point out that 2% of 28,147 is uh, 563. That means that there are still 563 records or studies that were found to be useful for this report. So that is still easily within the remit of a reliable meta-analysis. So even based on this alone, I could just finish this section, but I really want to know where they got that 98% number from. So I'm going to keep searching. Looking deeper into this, it turns out that the search yield of 28,147 records led to 3,181 being identified as potentially relevant for the series of systematic reviews. And across all the reviews, 237 papers, including 113,269 children or adolescents from 18 countries were reviewed. And included studies were published between 1978 and 2022, with 162 of these published recently from 2017 to the end date of the search in 2022, which still doesn't come down to 98% of these studies were rejected but i mean it's actually not too far off one percent so i don't know why they wouldn't say 99 percent of these studies were rejected but i want to make this clear if this is where that figure comes from the 28,147 records were excluded record doesn't mean study according to this result there were only 214 studies that were actually considered from these records and if it's these 214 studies and it turns out that they rejected 98% of them which by the way that would mean that they only had about four studies for this meta-analysis then maybe they'd have a point but no I think they've screwed up understanding that the, out of the 28,000 records the vast majority of them weren't studies the, these records would just be mostly anecdotal evidence of individual cases of trans people's journey through the medical system. Anyway, I'm struggling to find anything else in the report about excluding studies or including studies. That's the majority of the information I can get on this meta-analysis and how they decided to include or exclude studies. And from what I can see and what I've shown here, it's all fairly reasonable. I just find it interesting that for some reason the trans radical activists meme which is up on screen again, by the way, decided to attack one specific pitfall that the meta-analysis had with studies when there were numerous. There were about 10. Double-blinded or blinded studies. I mean, one that's perfectly reasonable and even ethical 
medical trial study practice, but also they just completely ignore or <laughs> hide the fact that there were plenty of other reasons that reports were excluded. And I'm not actually sure where the 98% of studies were rejected came from. Again, from everything I can find when it comes to studies, again, they have nearly 30,000 records. 30,000 records doesn't mean 30,000 studies. I don't think the report even says how many studies in total there were. It just said that just under 300 of them were deemed to be good enough to be included in the meta-analysis, which, as I say before, I mean, it was, you know, 500-odd before, but still, even... Even nearly 300 is more than enough for a meta-analysis, which is what this report is. So, point one, stricken off, nothing wrong with it. Right, point two. The research that supported the report's anti-care conclusions were all accepted despite not being double-blinded and having obvious methodological flaws. Okay, let's take a look. I mean, I'm not going to lie, this has taken a while for me to go through this report, and I don't... They needed to put in a reference there because, you know, this is 300 reports to go through. And not only that, the way references are set up, obviously, they'll say, oh, these are the 200 odd reports that we went through or studies, I should say, that we went through. Actually, then trying to find which studies were the most influential for the anti-care conclusions or whatever they call it. Like, no, I need... <laughs> I understand it's just a meme, but if you're making any sort of meme like that, you've really got to at least reference something there because this makes my job impossible. Which I suppose is kind of part of the point. <laughs> you know, they're not making a meme to make this easy for me. They're making it to smear this review, which as far as I can tell is very fair. I mean, I suppose the best thing to do for now would be just to point out that it's not an anti-care model at all. A new model for gender services for children and young people. Firstly, you have a national provider collaborative, which sets the clinical standards, educational standards, does the clinical research, has national data and audits, and clinical decisions for medical pathways. In other words, you have this overarching body that writes the guidelines for how to deal with kids with these gender issues. And then on the one below, you have regional centres. So instead of just having one in London, you have a number around the United Kingdom where they have specialist assessment, treatment and ongoing therapeutic support, manage the operational delivery network for the region, have education and training for the operational delivery network, and have a consultation to design local specialist services. In other words, they literally want more specialist centres for kids with gender issues. This is anything but anti-care. And then finally, you have the designated local specialist services who deliver assessments for trans kids or kids with gender issues and have ongoing therapeutic support in a shared care arrangement with regional centres. In other words, instead of just having this kind of compartmentalised Tavistock centre where they can do pretty much anything without scrutiny, you now have a full top to bottom scrutiny of this entire process to make sure that kids are getting the best care they can. What TRAs mean by the anti-care model is that they're basically just not giving kids hormones when they ask for them, even when they say they're going to kill themselves. So <laughs> it's like already it's a lie. But I suppose the next best thing I can do, because there's no way I'm going through even a sample of the 300 studies that they have selected. I only have limited time. As so far, they have only lied in this meme. I'm going to assume that they're lying, that there was no double blinding in the studies that were accepted. And even if there are... As pointed out in the explanations, there are plenty of other pitfalls that can happen in studies. So what is possible is that they're accepting studies that only fall into one of these pitfalls, and if they fall into no others, then they will accept it for the meta-analysis to improve the sample numbers. I don't particularly know. They don't particularly know. I don't know why you trust anyone on Twitter claiming that they know all the information about this report when frankly this is the best video you're going to get that actually goes through the report. Anyway, back to the meme. Trans people under 25 shouldn't be trusted to make decisions about their bodies. Needless to say, this is just total nonsense. Throughout the report, there are these little boxes of recommendations, and I think at this point, 
we should actually go through what some of these recommendations are. And as you can see on the screen, we have recommendations seven through 10. Recommendation seven is cut off because, well, I want this to be readable. And recommendation says, long-standing gender incongruence should be an essential prerequisite for medical treatment, but only one aspect of deciding whether a medical pathway is the right option for an individual. In other words, let's make sure that transition is actually a good idea. Recommendation 8, this is the big one, NHS England should review the policy on masculizing or feminizing hormones. The option to provide masculizing or feminizing hormones from age 16 is available, but the review would recommend extreme caution. There should be clear clinical rationale for providing hormones at this stage rather than waiting until an individual reaches 18. In other words, what this implies is that age 18, you can literally decide if you should have hormones or not. It's entirely on you, rather than having even further checks from the person providing the hormones, whether 16 is the right age to do so. Recommendation nine, every case considered for medical treatment should be discussed at a national multidisciplinary team hosted by the National Provider Collaborative, replacing the multi-professional review group. Well, <laughs> incredible. We need to check that giving this person hormones is actually sensible. We need to really make sure that this trans stuff is actually the best route for this person. And recommendation 10, all children should be offered fertility counselling and pre preservation prior to going into a medical pathway. In other words, they need to make sure that they know that going on these hormones is going to probably make them infertile or whatever other risks may come as a result of that. Because that is a thing that a lot of these people do not like to get out there. This does affect your fertility. Anyway, the reason I went through all of those recommendations, again, all of them seem sensible to me, is to point out that 25 is clearly not the cutoff age for deciding whether you should pursue this medical route or not. Again, I should point out all these recommendations are just in the case of children that are considered to be going on to this medical pathway for hormones or puberty blockers or things like that. Clearly for recommendation eight, when the individual turns 18, this report has nothing to do with them, at least in terms of when they are initially going to go on to hormone replacement therapy. So where does this 25 year old figure come from? Well, that comes from recommendation 23. NHS England should establish follow through services for 17 to 25 year olds at each of the regional centers, either by extending the range of the regional children and young people service or through linked services to ensure continuity of care and support at a potentially vulnerable stage in their journey. This will also allow clinical and research follow up data to be collected. In other words, what a shock the trans radical activists are lying that 25 year olds cannot make their own decisions. No, that is not what this recommendation is saying. This recommendation is saying, make sure that if a child has been put on gender affirming care before the age of 18, they actually get the follow up care, i.e. do the whole course <laughs> of gender affirming care up until they're at least 25. And I don't even think it's saying at least 25. I think it's just saying complete the service, which I'm not exactly sure how long it takes, but say it takes six years and you start at the age of 16, you'll be doing the follow through care till you're 24. It's not just that you turn 18 and get kicked out of the child identity clinic service or whatever it is. No, you stay on there until you are at least 25 and the follow ups are all complete. And also, as they say, it allows them to collect data from trans kids. It allows the long-term studies to be completed. Nowhere is it saying that you can't start hormone therapy until you're at least 25. This is a ridiculous lie. Anyway, back to the lying meme. Conversion therapy should be first considered before allowing someone to transition. Luckily, the report actually addresses conversion therapy. The intent of psychological intervention is not to change the person's perception of who they are, but to work with them to explore their concerns and experiences and help alleviate their distress, regardless of whether they pursue a medical pathway or not. It is harmful to equate this approach to conversion therapy as it may prevent young people from getting the emotional support they deserve. No formal science-based training in psychotherapy, psychology or psychiatry teaches or advocates conversion therapy. If an individual were to carry out such practices, they would be acting outside of the professional guidance and this would be a matter for the relevant regulator. In other words, this summary is saying we do not do conversion therapy. So what is it that they're doing instead? Well, to summarise, there are many different ways of helping gender questioning young people improve their health and well-being regardless of their longer term decisions about medical or social transition. Part 3 described a wide range of associated conditions that may be part of a picture of gender-related distress. 
A holistic package of care to address these issues may involve a broad range of options such as supporting a young person get back into school, diagnosing autism or ADHD, supportive group sessions, psychological interventions to help anxiety, depression or trauma, building resilience, working with the whole family to address breakdowns in relationships, proving more, uh, sorry, providing more information about gender expressions and the range of possible interventions. In other words, what this is saying is that there is a wide range of associated conditions with gender identity issues and what this part is saying is that well we're going to try and treat them for that first and if these issues still persist then we need to look at alternatives and as i say this isn't conversion therapy this is just basic mental health procedures this is how they help all sorts of people with their mental health issues and gender identity issues are a mental health issue they're saying don't go to the medical procedure that should be last resort first Let's try and break down the other symptoms first, and if it persists, then we go the medical route. And as it says, this isn't conversion therapy, and if this ends up being considered conversion therapy, then this is only going to destroy young people's lives. So what other lies does the meme have? The reports say social transition shouldn't be allowed without clinical involvement, so you should see a doctor before deciding which clothes to wear. So let's see what the report has to actually say about social transition. Firstly, it has basically no effect on the mental health of the child. However, socially transitioning does increase the likelihood that the child will end up going down a medical pathway, which is obviously what we want to avoid if it's completely unnecessary because of all the harmful side effects that this study also lays out. So although it is not possible to know from these studies whether earlier social transition was causative in this outcome, Lessons from studies of children with differences in sexual development show that a complex interplay between prenatal androgen levels, external genitalia, sex of rearing and socio-cultural environment all play a part in eventual gender identity. Basically the sort of thing sucks for insect people. Therefore, sex of rearing seems to have some influence on eventual gender outcome. And it is possible that social transition in childhood may change the trajectory of gender identity development for children with early gender incongruence. In other words, affirming a social transition as the child is younger will effectively enforce their identity of transness, I guess is the best way to put it. And obviously part of the reason for this report is actually, well, we want what's best for the person and putting them early on this pathway in childhood might not be the best thing for them. That's effectively what this part is saying. The clinician should help families to recognize normal developmental variation in gender role behavior and expression. Avoiding premature decisions and considering partial rather than full transition can be a way of ensuring flexibility and keeping options open until the development trajectory becomes clear. Or summarizing recommendation four, when families or carers are making decisions about social transition of pre-pubertal children, Services should ensure that they can be seen as early as possible by a clinical professional with relevant experience. In, in other words, I, this is really odd to me, but the trans radical activists who are typically saying trust the experts are now saying your child should not see an expert before they do something that is abnormal. I, I mean, it's all the language of this meme, isn't it? Oh, your child needs to see a clinician before they decide what clothes to wear. No, they're seeing a clinician to make sure that the family carers and child have full context of what social transitioning actually means and what it can mean in the future for the child. I don't understand how having a full context of what you're actually doing to your child could be a problem, but there we go. Next up, every trans youth testimony were discarded for being biased. Well, as made clear in the explainer earlier in the video when it comes to bias, Again, bias doesn't necessarily mean, you know, bigotry or unconscious bias or all these really loaded terms that have come about via the social justice movement. No, bias means, in a purely scientific term, by the way, bias means there are potential unseen errors from this study due to the fact that it is not following absolutely every scientific medical methodology. And <laughs> the problem with testimony from individuals is that it's anecdotal evidence and I don't even think it was dismissed because as the report goes through everything was reviewed but anyway I will take uh, in an act of grace I will take a further look into this wouldn't you know it having a quick look into this turns out it's basically not true. Different studies looked at different outcomes of social transition. The only consistent benefit from social transition was for the use of chosen name in adolescence 
One study found that this was associated with some improvements in mental health and reduced suicidality for 15 to 21 year olds. Another study found that parental use of chosen name and being able to express one's gender was associated with some improvements in mental health slash distress for 16 to 24 year olds. One study looking at transgender adults found that lifetime suicide attempts and suicidal ideation in the past year was higher among those who had socially transitioned as adolescents compared to those who had socially transitioned in adulthood. In other words, this analysis has found that yes, short-term mental health improvements are obviously there. Once you get into adulthood, the opposite actually happens. This is why this meta-analysis is important. So, gender identity outcomes. One study used self-selected community sample of children. Children had to be between 3 and 12 years old at age of enrolment and had have been made a complete binary social transition, including changing their pronouns to the binary gender pronouns that were not those used at their birth. In other words, none of this is uh, nonsense. The study found that 93% of those who socially transition between 3 and 12 continue to identify as transgender at the end of the study about 5.4 years later. Of the remainder, 2.5 were living as cisgender, 3.5 as non-binary, and 1.3% have retransitioned twice. Oh my god. This study also demonstrated that the majority of children who had socially transitioned went on to progress to medical interventions. Another study found that childhood social transition was a predictor of persistence of gender dysphoria for those birth-registered male, but not those birth-registered female. Interesting. In this study, 96% of those birth registered male and 54% of those birth registered female who later de de desisted had not socially transitioned at the point of referral and none had fully transitioned. The study noted that the possible impact of social transition on cognitive representation of gender identity, that is how the child came to see themselves, or on persistence had not been studied. That was a lot of words, so let me summarise. Socially transitioning at a younger age appears to enforce gender dysphoria in a person. A majority of the men who do not socially transition don't end up fully transitioning, whereas about half of those who are female who don't socially transition still carry on to become transgender. But these studies also don't go into detail on how socially transitioning actually causes persistence in gender identity issues, etc. But the whole point of me going through all that was to basically show that no, transgender testimonies were not just dismissed by the report. Here was a number of studies where all the study was was transgender people's testimony. That's all these studies were. And how does it finish off? It says, there was also an association between childhood social transition and more intense gender dysphoria. So it may be that the intensity of the dysphoria was a factor that led to persistence and the more pressing drive for the children to socially transition. Which, the only po reason that I'm pointing that out is to say that this report is quite clearly showing that social transition reinforces gender dysphoria. In other words, it is making the mental health issue more persistent. As basically all psychologists knew 10 years ago, if you affirm the mental health issue, it gets worse. Anyway, point being after going through all that is that one, there were very interesting findings in these studies, and two, Yes, the meme yet again has lied. Well, the next claim in this meme is that neurodivergent people shouldn't be allowed to transition. Again, we've probably already gone through this, but I will look through it properly. But as pointed out before, psychotherapy, we're going to try and deal and diagnose other mental health issues before we go into the full-on transitioning mode. Again, completely sensible statement and probably isn't even what the recommendations say. Nowhere does it say, if this child is autistic, don't transition them. Recommendation 2. Clinicians should apply the assessment framework developed by the review's clinical expert group to ensure children or young people referred to NHS gender services receive a holistic assessment of their needs to inform an individualised care plan. This should include screening for neurodevelopment conditions including autism spectrum disorder and a mental health assessment. The framework should be kept under review and evolve to reflect emerging evidence. What a surprise, it doesn't say don't transition them. It says treat individual referral as a case-by-case -case basis and effectively try and see if there are other disorders here and then deal with them first. That's all this recommendation is saying. It's not saying don't transition them. It's saying transition should be one of the last things you do, which is obviously sensible. Anyway, why do they say to do that? Well, Table 3 shows synthesised summary data on prevalence of autism and ADHD where this was available in the papers included in the systematic review. 
Some research studies have suggested that transgender and gender diverse individuals are three to six times more likely to be autistic than cisgender individuals after controlling for age and educational attainment. And as you can see from the table below, this appears to be true. Just to make that table extra clear for people, effectively, autism is found in a range of 0% to 26% of people referred to gender identity clinics and ADHD is found in 2.5 to 27 percent of the people found uh, being referred to gender identity clinics. These findings are echoed by clinicians who report seeing teenage girls who have good cognitive ability and are articulate but are struggling with gender identity, suicidal ideation and self-harm. In some of these young people the common denominator is undiagnosed autism which is often missed in adolescent girls. Others may go on to receive a diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder when they enter adult services. Despite often being highly articulate, intelligent and skilled in many areas, autistic young people have difficulties with social communication and peer relationships which may take it which may make it difficult for them to feel accepted and fit in. Difficulties with interoception, making sense of what is going on in their bodies, and alexithymia, recognizing and expressing their emotions, can sometimes make it hard for these young people to express how they are feeling about their internal sensations, their gender identity and their sexual identity. In other words, you have to be extra careful with autistic people because they are struggling already socially. And if they are struggling already socially, they're going to be struggling with their own identity because your identity is effectively molded by your social environment. And so if they feel uncomfortable in their body, they are probably going to apply that to their gender and that may develop into gender dysphoria. That doesn't necessarily mean treating them with transitional medical practices or whatever is necessarily the right way to go. So make absolutely sure it is. That's all this report is saying. Saying don't transition autistic people is a ridiculous reductive statement. And again, a complete lie. Back to the meme. Right, the final one, which I find probably the most ridiculous because it is one of the most proven psychological differences between the sexes, even at the young, ripe young age of literally one minute born, is that toy preferences in childhood are biological and caused by hormones. So again, as most of you probably already know, completely reductive statement. But yes, boys typically prefer trucks, girls typically prefer dolls. There is obviously a major biological component to boys and girls having toy preferences, but let's see what the study has to say about this. I mean, just looking at the report instantly, it's basically showing what I already knew. So figure 18 summarizes these characteristic sex differences in humans. The use of the term boys toys and girls toys by the author may feel uncomfortable, but it is a classification that is used in, academic stu in the academic study because girls like humans and animals, boys like trucks and things that go boom. Gross reductive statement, I know, but hey, there's enough difference for it to actually matter. The figure also illustrates the size of the sex difference in adult human height. Height is incurred to provide a familiar comparator for contextualizing the sizes of the behavioral or psychological sex differences. So figure 18, we have a bunch of bell curves and surprise, surprise, there's differences between men and women. So in terms of height, men have a slightly higher peak than women. Ooh. Identification with male gender. It, <laughs> amazingly, look at that. Women generally don't identify with the male gender. Men generally do. What a shock. Interest in male sex partners. Again, men generally prefer women. Women generally prefer men. What a shock. Gender role behavior. Again, two peaks. Men tend to be more masculine. Women tend to be more feminine, though. Obviously, there's a bit more overlap than the sexual partners and the identity peaks. Interest in boys' toys. Much closer, really, than any other of the sex differences that we have seen so far, but clearly there is a boys' peak and a girls' peak. You know, there are some girls that like Lego. There are some boys that like Barbie. What a shock. I mean, you know, I had a brother and a sister. You know, I prefer to play with my brother's toys. That didn't mean I never played with my sister's. And finally, interesting girls toys again, pretty much the same bell curves, but reversed. Again, this is stuff that we all know, but where does the claim that this is all down to hormones and genetics come from in the meme? So like other areas of development, gender identity and gender role behaviors have typical milestones. Differences in gender role behaviors are apparent in preschool. 
when the kids are two and three years old. When children start to show gender stereotype behaviour in their play, around this time they seek to play with same-sex peers. Toy choices have been extensively studied. Researchers classify toys into those that are typically preferred by boys, like cars and trucks, and those that are typically preferred by girls, such as dolls. A systematic review in 2020, by the way, demonstrates that these differences in toys choices are actually very large. Unlike biological characteristics such as height, there is a large overlap in gender role behaviour. This variability in gender role expression exists from an early age. Some girls exhibit behaviours that are traditionally perceived as more masculine and boys behaviours that are more feminine. A common assumption is that toy choices and other gender role behaviour are solely a result of social influence. For example, that boys are only given trucks and girls will only be given dolls to play with. And although there is some partial truth, there is, there is evidence for prenatal and postnatal hormone influence on these behaviours, which will be discussed later. Which, yeah, I, I mean, I don't even need to go into the gritty details of it. And we've gone over for an hour now, and there's no way I'm going to get into the gritty detail of something that is just obviously true and largely well studied. This is a difference that comes up all the time in conversations about the differences between men and women. This phenomenon happens in chimps for God's sake, and they are not socialised in the same way as humans. And socialisation is downstream from biology anyway, so yeah, obviously biology has a large influence on this. I mean, even in the Scandinavian gender paradox, that small documentary that the Norwegian comedian made to find out why there are sex and gender differences, even there, the Cambridge professor, Sasha uh, Baron Cohen's brother was explaining how even newborn babies, literally from the minute they're born, there was a study to show them a picture of a crane and a human face. Girls would naturally look more at the human face, boys would naturally mo look more at the crane. Even before they've had a chance to be socialised, there is a difference here. An overall difference. Again, general difference. Obviously there's overlap. The study isn't saying there isn't any overlap. The study isn't saying that everything is biologically deterministic. Obviously, the study isn't discounting the fact that there are tomboys and that there are theatrical boys. Just absolutely insane things said by this meme, and this is a popular meme as well. This is what we can say is generally what the trans radical activists think of this report, and wouldn't you know it, literally everything turns out to be not true. And from my study of this report, and from what I've gone through in this video and researched, effectively, everything in this report seems pretty much on board. You know, there's things in there that I naturally think, oh, that's not the best way to go. But ultimately, what this report is saying is, my God, we really don't know much about this. We should really proceed with caution when it comes to this issue, especially when it comes to putting them through medical transitions, which are largely irreversible and cause further complications. And you know what? If that's where we're at the point with this whole debate, that is fine. I am fine with the NHS landing on that conclusion. But the trans radical activists who are going out of their way to lie about this, they need to effectively be kicked out of the entire institution because they are going to cause way more pain and suffering than is necessary. So I would like to personally thank Dr. Hilary Cass for publishing this report. There's some things in there where I can see the, uh, let's call it leftist influence in say the language and things like that. But Overall, over 388 pages, I found, you know, a couple of examples of that. Overall, that is fine. This is better than what you can expect from most public bodies these days, so congratulations there. And when it comes to the TERFs, I mean, as I say, if JK Rowling is the person we go off, effectively, she has said, this is the most robust review of the medical evidence for transitioning kids that we have, and that is true. And it's not even saying don't transition kids, it's saying be very, very careful and very, very certain that it's the best way to go with it. Hence, we have recommendations for review boards and entire institutional structures to keep an eye on each part of the whole process. That's about as good as we can expect, so well done, I hope this is all implemented. But if there are any TERFs out there, and I, I haven't really seen this, I've only seen TRAs accuse other TERFs of doing this, so how true this position is, I don't know. But if there are TERFs out there effectively saying, oh, this is saying that gender dysphoria doesn't exist and that we should never transition kids. No, that's not what it's saying. But as I say, that's just the trans radical activists kind of meme of the whole TERF position. And given that clearly TRAs lie about this report, I wouldn't be surprised if they're lying about that either. So there we are. So as I say, very good report. Trans radical activists constantly lie. TERF seeing the more reasonable side of this debate.
so congratulations to that. You have my tacit seal of approval specifically for this debate, but uh, later down the line when the TRAs are out of here, please don't go radically feminist again. It's really cringe. Anyway, having said all that, I'm surprised I got through this in only an hour and ten minutes, but I'm happy with that result. Uh, <laughs> I hope uh, you all have a very good weekend in uh, terms of shilling for me. This uh, took quite some time, so um, hopefully it will be monetized. You know, I'd, it's a bit uncouth to, uh, you know, beg for money or anything like that, but this does take time. So, you know, anything that you can spare, whether you become a member, whether you give a super thanks, whether you just watch more of my content, that alone is excellent and We'll keep these videos going and keep the channel alive. Uh, you know, join the discords down below, the Wellington Project and me and my girlfriend's own personal one. Please follow me on Twitter and obviously subscribe to me here. Like the video, favourite it, do whatever else. It all helps the channel. And uh, after a big video like this, I, I think I've earned my shilling. So uh, in, in other shilling news, uh, Tosh, the other side of the hill, the newscast will be back last week. A lot of you don't seem to know I do other live streams so that's why I started chilling them at the end of every video so uh, if you want to hear about my takes on other parts of the news that's been going on throughout the week please join us on Tosh and then the week after we will have a general discussion about Harry Potter and its consequences for society so uh, I hope you're interested in that please join the Wellington Project to keep up to date with all that news I also am on regional variations on the Tailed Features channel every Wednesday so there it's basically just three lads talking absolute nonsense to each other while going through funny stories from around the UK from the week. And finally, Laughing at the Guardian will return next week. Once I finalise guests, you will know the guest list for that. But they should be big guests, so please do as well. Keep your Friday night free for that. And as for regular content, well, it's regular content. I will still be trying to make three videos a week or keep that average up. And I hope that you all are enjoying what you are seeing on this channel. Please do subscribe to the channel. Please do share it with all your friends and family who you think would be interested in this as it does help grow the channel. And, you know, I do like doing this as a hobby and I do like informing people and doing more robust research videos like this. I, I think they're useful to all of us. So, as I say, do all that stuff and we'll be grand. Right, enough of that cringe now. That's everything I had for you today. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, goodbye.